Amen. Uh, as you, uh, I want to ask first if you would just open your Bibles to the book of 1 John. This message is going to be a little bit different. Um, just, it's, it's more of an introduction to a series that we're going to do. So 1 John is towards the end um, of your Bible in the New Testament. And, um, and so as, as Vince was saying, as you're turning in your Bibles, the September 16th, so two weeks from today, Jonathan White will be here. And uh, are, is there anybody in here that's familiar with Jonathan White? Okay, those of you that, uh, my mom and dad, and, and those of you that came from Chapel Hill are familiar with them. So Jonathan White, uh, uh, let me ask this question. Are any of you familiar with the Grand Old Opry? Okay. Are any of you familiar with the Gaithers? Jonathan White has done both. Folks, you don't sing at the Grand Old Opry and with the Gaithers unless you are unusually talented. And I'm just telling you, I, I mentioned this last Sunday, and those that listened <laughs> realized that I, was, I don't say these things unless I know them to be true. Last Sunday, I told you, you better show up because it's going to be a blessing. And we had a tremendous service on Sunday evening. Um, Ashley Shantyfelt led up the dessert part. and so thankful for her as she did all of that and got that all ready as we had Sundays. And, um, and then we had uh, Lindsay Ford, the, the worship leader from the Church of Chapel Hill, come and do a mini concert. And was she not a blessing, those that were here? Uh, th this, is, this is the blessing that she was. As she sang her last song, everyone just sat there. They're like, you're not done yet. No, sing another one. You're not done. Sing another song. And, and then we had just a wonderful time of encouragement with the focus being on sweet Claudia. Claudia, raise your hand, Claudia. So Claudia, we're, we're going to just, uh, just going to wear this one out until she's, till she is gone, sadly. But she's moving to Florida here sooner than later. And so we wanted to emphasize our appreciation for Claudia Parker as uh, she heads to Florida um, here probably in a few weeks. And uh, so it was just a great night. Now, I say all that to say the 16th, don't miss it. You don't want to miss it. I hope that, that it, we're able to do it outside if it's not too hot and the weather permits. We'll have a little concert on the lawn. As Vince mentioned, uh, we'll have, uh, get our snow cone machine out and uh, have some different things going on. It, I asked Jonathan to do this for us because I want us to, to invite our neighbors. I want us to invite maybe some friends that, that don't know the Lord to this. So I asked him, I said, Jonathan, do you have any neutral songs you can play? And he's like, what do you mean neutral? I said, well, I want this to be a little bit of an outreach. And so as we invite people, I want to say, hey, we've got a guy coming in to do a concert for our church, but he's going to sing some songs maybe like from the Eagles. Anyone know the Eagles? Yeah. Got a peaceful, easy feeling. Is that the Eagles? Yeah, okay. So, so I don't know if he'll sing anything from the Eagles, but, but I told him, I said, neutral songs, a few of them, to just kind of you know, hit, hit a chord with some folks and, and maybe get them to come. And, uh, and so he's going to sing some neutral songs and then he's going to just absolutely, just speaking as a young guy and, and some lingo that young kids speak in, he's going to rock the house. <laughs> it's going to be an awesome, awesome night. And uh, so, so you do not want to miss that. And, and here's how he comes. We take, that day, we're going to take a love offering. So we would ask that you already make a budget for that. Uh, we're going to take a love offering for him. He comes and plays based off a love offering. And um, we want to send him home, um, you know, being, being blessed for blessing us. And so, so uh, make sure that you put that into your calendars two weeks from uh, today. Uh, he'll be here in the morning service and the evening service. And then also, um, our, um, our cleaning ladies normally clean the very first Monday um, in, of the month. And that falls on Labor Day this week. So ladies, don't come clean the church on Monday. Um, we'll, we'll try to reschedule that. That's from Dick Levesey. He told me to make that announcement. And so, so don't, don't come to the church on Monday. We'll, we'll work that out. And so we just wanted to make sure that you were aware of that. And then I don't see Gina here this morning, but uh, Jason's wife, Gina, her birthday was this week. So if you, uh, if you see her or see her on social, social media, uh, reach out to her and wish her a, a very, very, very happy birthday. Well, there you go. Lots of more, lots more announcements. It's good to see everybody this morning. And uh, we're going to start a new series that's called 
No. K-N-O-W. No. The book of 1 John is a powerful, powerful book. It's a life-changing book in the Bible. And my desire with this series called No is to go verse by verse, chapter by chapter. Thankfully, for your part, it's only five chapters long. But, but one of my greatest desires as a pastor is this. I love to be able to show people that you can read the Word of God and understand it. Now, if you're like me, there are times where we read the Bible and we're like, English, please. All right, go ahead. Raise your hand if that's been you at one point or time. You're like, I, I don't know. That's hard to understand. I don't read my Bible because it's tough to understand. That's one of the greatest blessings of my life is to help people see that it's possible to read the very Word of God and understand it. And 1 John is a book in the Bible that everybody needs to grasp and understand. It is extremely powerful. And so I want to give you a little introduction to the book of 1 John. Hopefully there's a pencil near you because I'd love for you to jot some notes down in the weeks ahead and even today. Uh, but let me give you a little background about the, first, uh, the book of 1 John. It was written by, guess who? What do you think his name was? John. Ding, ding, ding. We've got some Bible scholars in the room. John was one of the 12 disciples. Now, since you're participating well this morning, that's not always the case here. I like this. I'm going to give you another opportunity. Does anybody know another name that the Bible gives to John? He's called a couple different things. Good names, not bad names. He is called, I see somebody, go ahead. The beloved disciple. Jesus' beloved disciple. That is absolutely true. He is called the beloved disciple because we, as we read the Bible, we see that John was in Jesus' inner circle. He was really close, shoulder to shoulder with Jesus. And if you remember at the end of Jesus' earthly life, he was hanging on the cross and he looked down at his mother and he looked down at the beloved disciple John and he says behold your mother so he's saying John you're gonna take care of my mom now that was the beloved disciple John he is the one who wrote this book uh, first John second John and third John we also believe that he wrote the gospel of John Matthew Mark Luke John and here a little, little more nugget of truth the book of Revelation was probably written by John but first John is where we're gonna be and John the disciple wrote this book um, he wrote this book listen to this somewhere between this is important somewhere between AD 95 and early AD 100s now that's important and here's why our earliest copy so we don't have like the the paper and pen so to speak that that John used to write down the words of first John right and we don't have those but what we do have are copies now, some of you are already thinking, well, isn't that a little unreliable? And I always ask this question. Have any of you ever uh, questioned Plato's existence? Like, do you know Plato? Where's our, where's our teenage high schoolers? Plato, do you know P Plato, right? You know who Plato is? The great what? He's the great philosopher. Everybody knows Plato, right? What we know of Plato, listen, what we know of Plato comes from copies that are 600 years to 1,000 years after Plato's documents were recorded, the original <laughs> documents. Nobody questions Plato, right? Uh, how about Julius Caesar? Anybody know that name? Raise your hand. You know Julius Caesar? Okay, Julius Caesar. Anybody like, I don't think that guy was really a real person. He wasn't a historical figure. I, nobody says that. Well, we know of Julius Caesar. What we read about Julius Caesar are copies of what somebody wrote down, a lot of Julius Caesar's own works, that are 
oftentimes 800 years after he wrote it. Nobody questions it. The book of 1 John, the earliest copy we have, is the early 200 A.D., right? And when did we say that he wrote it? 95 A.D. So we're talking about a difference of what? 105 years-ish. Ish. And it's amazing that some people are like, I don't know. I don't know about that Bible. I don't know if, I, if, I don't know if this Jesus guy really ever existed. I, I don't know if the, uh, this guy John really existed. Folks, then Julius Caesar didn't exist. Plato didn't exist. Picking up what I'm putting down. We have the Bible, a very, the most reliable historical document that we have in our world today is in your hands when you go by the test that I was just kind of sharing with you. And the great thing about the Bible is we just don't have one copy. You know, we have a few copies of Julius Caesar's works. We have thousands and thousands and thousands of copies of the New Testament. Awesome stuff. And so, John did write this. And even though our copies are 100 years apart from the originals, it's extremely reliable. And so the question is, why did he write the book of 1 John? This is what I want us to get to today. Why did he write the book of 1 John? Well, there's two reasons. I'm going to give those two reasons first, and then I'm going to explain a little bit about them. Can you, can you bear with me on that? So the first reason John wrote the book of 1 John is this. He wanted to refute false teachers. To refute false teachers. We'll dive into that in a minute. The second reason he wrote this is he wanted to assure genuine believers. Got that? I'd write that down at the top of 1 John in your Bible. That's a good thing to write down. Purpose. To refute false teachers. That's A. B. To encourage or to assure genuine believers let's dig into that for a minute so in this day that John was writing this in approximately AD 95 ish we'll say AD 100 the very tail end of his life this was a day listen to this I, I, I read this from a Bible scholar this is the day that day this is the this is the environment that they were living in the society that they were living in it was a day where there was always room for a new religion Sound a little similar? There was always room for a new religion. This, this came from a, Bible, a very well-known Bible scholar says this. Uh, it was a day where there was always room for a new religion, provided it was not exclusive in nature. You know what that word exclusive means? You're not the only religion. You can have your own religion, but it can't be the only one. It can't, you can't be dogmatic about it that your way is the right way. You got that? So any religion was accepted in that day. Any religion was accepted in that day, except if it was an exclusive religion. All right? And so, so here's some of the things that were taking place in these religions. Are you ready? The first thing, uh, you don't have to write this down, but I think it's a good word to know, is, is uh, syncretism. So you know the word synchronize, right? The word synchronize, what's that mean? To put th two things together to work it together, right? Well, I, I'll take a little bit of this and a little bit of this, and we'll make them work together. We'll, we'll bring them together. That, folks, is what was going on in John's day. People would take a little bit of this belief in one religion, a little bit of this belief in one religion, a little bit of, you know what, I'm going to figure this out myself. I'm going to make up my own way because I just feel in my heart that this is right. And boom! We've got a new religion, and I'll name it what I want, how I want, when I want, and even where I want. That's the day that they were living in. And I can't help but think how similar our day is today. Synchronism. Combining various ideas and new beliefs and old beliefs from different sources to form new religions. There was also something going on at the time very prevalent in John's day that was called the mystery religions. Now raise your hand. Not everybody's really familiar with the mystery religions. Anybody ever heard of the mystery religions? Okay. If you want to know about them, I don't encourage you to do this. Just look on Netflix 
Um, look up, you can even look up on Google and you'll hear about these mystery religions. I have a, an unsaved friend uh, back uh, in my hometown. And this unsaved friend, you can't convince him that Jesus was a historical man. And, and the reason you can't convince him is he says, well, Mark, in these mystery religions, like, like back in Egypt, there's this God that's called Osiris. And, and there's another God that's called, I think, Isis, or I can't pronounce this false God correctly, but he's like, and do you know the story behind them? It's the same exact story of, of Jesus who, who supposedly lived the perfect life, some guy, and then died and then resurrected from the grave and he was born of a virgin. And so there's these mystery religions using similar stories of Christianity but, but tying it into their own beliefs and their own gods, naming their own gods. That's the mystery religions. Huge during John's time. Huge during John's time. And, you know, that's so significant. I, I want to give you a little bit about these mystery religions. Bear with me. Listen to this. This is important. Mystery religions were part of a, di a diverse religious movement that surfaced during the first century and died out by the end of the fifth century. Uh, I'm going to name some of these mystery religions outside of the ones I just named. The most well-known mystery religions to emerge were from the Greek cults. Uh, I probably will butcher these names. Demeter, Eleusinian, Dionysus. Is that right? That's not right. Um, well, none of you raised your hand about knowing them, so I, I sound perfect in your ears, right? <laughs> the Syrian cult of Adonias, the Egyptian cults of of Isis and Osiris. And so, so this is where these all originated from. And, and here's, uh, here's just something pretty interesting. The mystery religions, all of them, listen, all of them were syncretistic. Remember our word, synch uh, syncretism? They were all syncretism, which means the followers of the mystery religions would incorporate beliefs from different religions to add to what they already believed. They brought all these together. Now, pretty interesting that this religion was most prominent during the days of Christ and shortly after. And uh, we're not going to get into the defense of any of that right now, but that's the day John was living in. And to be honest with you, it's, it's rising back up again today. You don't have to go far to have a discussion or read a documentary or watch a documentary of these mystery religions. And so, again, his purpose, A, to refute false teachers, this syncretism, these mystery religions. At the time, there was a god by the name of Artemis. Any of you familiar with this? This God, thank you, I, I, I love our high school st scholars here, always raising their hand, always like, hey, yeah, I know this, and, and leaning over and giving a little extra input, I like that, all right, participation award. And, uh, and so, so here's, here's what's so important about this, this Greek God, supposedly was the daughter of Zeus, familiar with Zeus, raise your hand, you know Zeus, okay, so, so Artemis, the, the daughter of Zeus, twin brother was Apollos, everybody pretty much knows those false gods names right and um, and so here's what's so impressive is there was a temple built in Artemis's time which was John's time also that was considered one of the seven wonders of the world it's the day John's in that is giving him his purpose for writing this book Lots of stuff happening around genuine followers of Christ that were confusing followers of Christ. But one of the main reasons that he was refuting false teachers, one of the biggest um, false things that was taking place was people's belief on Jesus. Listen to this. this again, this was roughly 50, 60 years after Jesus died. John is writing this. And all of these different beliefs started coming up about Jesus. 
You can read these in non-Christian documents. Okay? You can read these. This, this is not just internal evidence of the Bible. This is external stuff that you can read that people who don't believe in God and Jesus write these things. Here's some of the false beliefs that were going on that John wanted to refute about Jesus. They were denying that Jesus was actually deity. That Jesus was actually deity means God. A God. They were denying that Jesus was God. They were saying, this man wasn't God. He was just a man. He was just human. Yeah, he may have died on the cross, but he was insane. Only an insane man would do that. I would strongly encourage you to read a book that really ministered to my heart. It's called More Than a Carpenter by Josh McDowell. As he dives into this thought that Jesus was just human. He was just human. And looking at the evidence of Jesus' life and his ministry and how he died makes no sense that he was just human. I'd write that down if you'd like a quick, good read. But that was one belief about Jesus that was a false belief that was going on. There was another set of individuals or groups that didn't deny the deity of Christ, but they denied the humanity of Christ. So their, their argument wasn't, well, well, Jesus wasn't really God. Their argument was, he was just God in spirit form. He wasn't fully human. He was a spirit that you could see and touch, but, but he wasn't really human. That's the belief at the time that was going on about this Jesus. And then there was another belief about Jesus at the time that said that he was fully man until Jesus got baptized. Pop quiz, since we're so good at our Bible studies today. Who baptized Jesus? John, the man, you guys are smart. I love it. That's called, I call that K-Y-B, Know Your Bible. You guys got it. Good job. And so, so John the Baptist, when, when Jesus got baptized by John the Baptist, do you remember what happened? Right after, right after he was baptized, what happened? Somebody. The clouds broke open. A dove came, right? And so the Bible even says the Spirit of God was just like, woo, right there. And so, so this new belief at the time of John was, hey, Jesus was fully human. At the time he was baptized, then he became like God-man. But when he died at his crucifixion, the Spirit left him and he was human again. Crazy stuff people making up, right? That's what's happening in this moment as John is writing the book of 1 John. His purpose, A... He wanted to refute all of these false teachings. Purpose B. This is what my brother Josh was mentioning that I got an aha moment. Purpose B. Not only A, was he uh, refuting false teachers, but B, he was, he was assuring genuine believers. Where do you get that from, Mark? How, how do you know that he was trying to give confidence in people's salvation. Give confidence and, and assurance that, that genuine believers were truly living the right stuff. How do you know? It's interesting, that word K-N-O-W. Take your pencils. This is good. I didn't learn this from a commentary. I like to read commentaries, which are basically studies of the Bible. This is my own study of the Bible. I'm sure I'm not the only one that's ever discovered this. But I want you to, to look in 1 John and have a little patience with me here. But take your pencil, and every time we come to the word K-N-O-W, I want you to do a favor. Do me a favor and yourself a favor. Circle it. You ready for this? Just give you a heads up. We're going to be here for a little bit. Now, look at the, book, the first chapter. I really don't have much underlined or circled in the first chapter. Then you get to the second chapter, so 1 John chapter 2. Look in verse 3. And hereby 
This is the King James Version. Sometimes other translations use other words that are synonyms of know. And hereby we do know. Verse 3, and right after that, that we know him. Every time you come to one, just circle it. Verse 4 of chapter 2, he that saith, I know him. Verse 5, but whosoever keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. Verse 5 of chapter 2. Now go down to verse 11. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whether he goes because that darkness has not blinded his eyes. Verse 11. Down to verse 13. I write unto you fathers because you have known him. That's good. Later down in verse 13, same chapter. I write unto you little children because you have known the father. Verse 14, right underneath that, I have written unto you fathers because you have known him. Folks, it's not rocket science. What's the name of the series again? No. Here we go. We're, let's keep going. We're not done yet. Down to verse 14. I have written unto you fathers because you have known him. Verse 14, known. That is from the beginning. Now go all the way down to verse 18. Little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard, the Antichrist shall come even now. Antichrist, by the way. You think that would be a false, false God? <laughs> right? I'm not making this stuff up. That's why John's writing it, to refute false doctrine and also to help genuine believers know. But in verse 18, even now are there many antichrists whereby we know that it is in the last times. Verse 20, but you have an unction from the Holy Ghost and ye know all things. Circle this. This is kind of Bible class today. That's okay. These are important, important things. Verse 21, still in chapter 2, by the way, crazy. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it and that no lies are in the truth, is of the truth, sorry. Uh, verse 23, I stretched a little bit here. Look at verse 23. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son, can we all agree, he acknowledged the son. He knew the son. This means the same thing. Okay, so no acknowledged. The word's in there. All right. Down to verse 29 of verse 2. If ye know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. I, 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 I love it. And, okay, this is what I do with my life. I get it. But it excites me that, that God showed me that this week. It's not rocket science reading the Bible. Like, it's just reading it. And, and oh, what's this? No, 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 no. Okay, and all right, let's go down to verse, or chapter 3. We're not done yet. We'll go quicker. Are you ready? Verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us, not because it knew him not. Two knows there. Verse 2. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not appear what we shall be, but we know that what... I'll just keep it there, verse 2. Look down in verse 5. And ye know... Am I going too fast? And ye know, verse 5. Now down to verse 6. Seneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Verse 6. Now go down to chapter 3, verse 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life. Verse 15, whoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. I have to turn the page. Verse 19, and hereby we know. Verse 20, for if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. I just get tickled as I even read it. I love it. Verse 24, and he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him, and whereby we know, by the way, if you don't have a pencil, you're bored right now, know, verse 24, and hereby we know that he abideth in us. Chapter 4, we're not done yet, verse 2, hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Chapter 4, verse 6, we are of God, he that knoweth God. Later on in that verse, still verse 6, hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Verse 7 of chapter 4, and at the very end of verse 7, and knoweth God. 
Verse 8, he that loveth not knoweth not God. By the way, that's evidence or assurance that you're saved. Little, little pre, uh, well, I'll just give you, we're ahead about five weeks there. But one of the evidences that you can be assured of your salvation is that you love, you have the same love in you that God has uh, for his world. And so we'll touch that later. Now let's go to verse 13 of chapter 4. Hereby know, verse 13, verse 16, and we have known. Now down to chapter 5, getting close to the end here. Verse 2, by this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and keep his commandments, there's another little hint of what's to come. And then go down to verse 13 of chapter 5. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Oh, that's a powerful verse. We're coming back to that in a moment. Verse 15, And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Verse 18, We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and the wicked one touches him not. Verse 19, And we know that we are of God. Oh, that's good. Number 20, verse 20, and we know that the Son of God has come. And later on in that verse, that we may know him. That is true. Now, anyone good in math? So now we have, we have, we have Bible class, now we have math class. How many knows was that? How many? I counted 40, 41, 40, 41. I'm going to ask you a question. Why did John write? The book of 1 John, what was his purpose? So that we can know. So that you can know. I want, I want to highlight what I believe the, the purpose verse is. Um, in chapter 5 of 1 John, verse 13. Can he spell it out any clearer than this? These things have I written unto you that believeth on the name of the Son of God. So I have, I have written these things to those who believe in Jesus. And for this reason I have written these things. That you may know that you have eternal life. And that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. He has written these things so that you can have confidence, assurance of your salvation. Now, you just read a whole book of the Bible in one church service. You're welcome. <laughs> Folks, now I want to share my heart on why God led me to this passage. Because I was in Destin, Florida, and didn't have my normal routine of reading the Bible. Normally I like to do it first thing in the morning and, and have my time of prayer, but our schedules were all whacked. The kids were up late and then sometimes up early because they were so excited and we have a little baby and so I didn't get my time in like I normally did, so I had to work it in in different ways and go out on the balcony, do it late at night. And I remember one of the things that I was doing is I was trying to read through from Acts all the way to the end of the Bible, and I was reading for a specific purpose. It was really in relation to where I feel like the Lord's laying on my heart in the weeks and months to come for us here at Summit, probably more like months or maybe years to come. I was looking for some different things, and then I came across the book of Ephesians and the book of 1 John, and I thought, I didn't just think, it was like two by four across the forehead. Mark, God was saying, I want you to spend some time there. I want you to spend some time there. And I thought, why? Why, why would we need to spend time in 1 John? And I started reading about all those no's. And I started looking in my own world and seeing friends and family members who were confused. We're living in a day and age, folks, where the United States of America 70 to 80 percent of Americans say, I'm a Christian. And I just gonna speak not out of 
anger. I want to speak not out of a... I want to speak from a place of love and concern. 80% of the United States of America is not Christian. If 80% of the United States of America were Christian, it wouldn't look like it looks today. And my heart is burdened for people who are confused. I have met people who would say, well, I, I know that I'm saved. I remember when I was in junior high and, and I prayed a prayer and asked Jesus into my heart. Awesome. That's great. Has God changed your life? Has there been transformation that's taken place in your life? You see, a profession of faith, a prayer, if it's just a prayer alone, that doesn't save us. That's here. God saves us here. I often say a lot of people miss heaven by 18 inches. It never gets from their head to their heart. And I am burdened for people who believe in a God. But there's no transformation in their life. And I am living proof. Some of you, I hope, many of you are living proof that God transforms our lives and changes our lives. And so, I'm burdened for just my friends and family and and. And as I've shared, our community, our, our community near and around us. I believe with all of my heart that God wants you to have a no-so faith. I know so. I know so. I'm going to ask my brother Josh to come and, and close with any song of your choosing. You can get set up. But while he's coming to set up, I want to share just a couple things with you. Any, uh, anybody in this room ever been rock repelling? Repelled a cliff. Pretty awesome stuff. Raise it high. We need to see. High. Okay, one, two, three, six or seven of you. Awesome. I've done that myself. And for those of you that, that uh, don't know my wife well, my wife Mary, um, she's a little bit more on the quieter side than me, at least, compared to me. I'm kind of outgoing. She's a little bit on the quieter side. Um, Mary would race you to be the first one to rock repel. That's just how much she loves it. Um, and so, so we have done that before in our past. And, and um, one of the awesome things about that is, is you have to have a, a lot of confidence in that rope if you're going to rock repel, right? You have a lot of confidence in that rope. And I remember repelling in Hawking Hills. I didn't realize that, that there were that tall of cliffs that close to us. I actually looked down and I couldn't see the bottom. It was like a 150 or 175 foot cliff. My buddy Matt Rowe was here. Matt, Jeff Schmidt took us on that, one of our college buddies. And uh, I was a little scared. And my wife just, boom, right on down. Hey, I'm first and like races to get there. And, and basically, for our purposes this morning, uh, my wife has a ton of confidence in those ropes. Like, I, like, if you're like me, I want to be like the third person, you know. If that rope's going to break, I want the person to be ahead of me, the little bit heavier than me, you know, right? Right? But don't leave me up here and act like that's not you either, except... except. And so, so uh, on another level, anybody in here skydive beside my awesome best friend, Matt Rowe? Skydivers, yeah? My dad skydived. I love you, Dad. Yeah, he did. I remember watching him. Now, you don't skydive, what? Unless you have a ton of confidence in the parachute, right? Now, I've never skydived. By the way, my wife is like dying to go skydiving. See, you're getting to know her a little bit more. And, uh, but you've got to have a ton of confidence in the parachute opening. You've got to have a ton of confidence in the rope not breaking. God wants to be your rope. He wants to be your parachute. That is where we're headed in the book of 1 John. 
Every week I'm going to come and I'm going to ask you a question. Every week from here on out in the book of 1 John, it's going to be, every message is going to be designed around one question that you've got to ask yourself. It's a test. All right, can you pass the test? You can be sure of your salvation if you answer the questions correctly. That's where we're heading in the weeks that come. And I challenge you to make it a point to be here. We have a lot of folks who are on the broad way, Jesus says. They think they're going to heaven. But Jesus said, it's the road to destruction. And many find it. But there's a narrow road that few find that leads to everlasting life. Folks, 1 John is getting us on the narrow road. I'm going to ask my brother Josh to play a song quietly in the background then lead us just one course maybe or a verse in a course. I'm going to close in prayer and then he's going to play this song. Father, we thank you for this morning in the book of 1 John. So grateful for small little revelation of 40 no's, K-N-O-W, in your word. And it's, <laughs> it's just still mind-blowing to me, Lord, that sometimes, sometimes we read and, and we miss stuff like that. It's because we read out of habit, we read out of routine, and we're not reading for you to read us, to speak to us. Hands down, Lord, I am convinced that this series is perfect in the timing and the life of our church. Lord, I don't want to cause anybody, it is not my desire and certainly not yours, to cause anybody to doubt their salvation. We don't, we don't, want, to, we don't want to raise any, any, any concerns if they're isn't something to be concerned about. But you tell us, I believe, in the book of 1 Corinthians, you say that all of us must examine ourselves to see if we are really in the faith. And I pray that your very power and presence and spirit would direct us and lead us and encourage us and help us to make sure that we are on that narrow road that leads to life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As Josh leads, you will be dismissed as he concludes. Thanks. Oh.